Hi guys, welcome to the channel. My name is Matt Garvey and we are here to talk about making comics today and we are in luck. You know, in the pantheon of British comics, there are a few people that are very, very important and we have one of those with us today. And if you don't know the name, I guarantee you will know the business. We are joined by the one and only Rich from Comic Printing UK. Rich, how are you doing, sir? I'm upright. And breathing. How, <laughs> how much more can a man ask for, right? In this day and age, nothing should be, you know, more important than that. And you know, to anyone that's watching, if you are in the UK and you are looking to print your first comic, Rich is the guy you need to go to. Okay, and I'm not just saying that. And I cannot speak highly enough about Rich. If you went on social media today and asked for recommendations, you know, of UK comic printers guarantee you know 80 to 90 percent of those people would say this guy right here so he is the man all his details you know for his twitter through you know his website that kind of thing so you can get hold of rich are going to be in the bottom but rich is here with us today because we are going to be talking about printing your first comic so rich if i was coming to you and saying look i've done my first comic i've you know i've got the art the colors the letters how and how does someone get hold of you i mean you know is it first you know just an email introduction do they contact you on twitter how does someone you know get you to help them basically yeah sure yeah uh i mean on the website there's there's a form that uh you know much like any kind of contact form uh but with a few extra questions which generally if you can answer all of them i can give you a quote and i can also kind of work out how to put this how much work you're going to be because <laughs> that's one of the okay. good things about rich is if you have never printed a comic before this guy will literally hold your hand through the whole process you know time permitting and stuff like that yeah. you know like because this again this is one of the reasons why rich is absolutely fantastic what he does is when you say how much work you're going to be if you could explain that in a little bit more detail that'd be fantastic well someone who knows the jargon who you know writes uh, a, a quote request and uh, you know, starts using print jargon at me. I am pretty sure that they've they've done it before. Uh, that they at least know the rudiments of what they need to do. They might have some bad habits that they picked up from working with other printers, but generally speaking, they're going to be less work than somebody who comes along and um, and you know can't doesn't distinguish between pages and sides for example now that's the page and side can mean the same thing depending on like if you if you're just doing if you're just chatting amongst your friends then yeah that would mean this that, that could very easily mean the same thing but if you know printing then you know that a side is what i'm interested in and a page isn't really of any interest to me whatsoever um but i'm going to call it a page so yeah it's I can I can work out. I mean, I've been doing this now ten years. I can work out from that first contact. You know, if someone puts in so there's a, there's a box there for how many pages are there in your comic, and when you click on it, a little hover up comes on and says this has to be divisible by four because that's how physics works. And if someone's put in something that's divisible by three or divisible by two, you're going to have an you, issue. Comic pun intended. Yeah. Yeah, you you know that that person is going to need a little bit more uh, walking through. Everyone needs some walking through, but it's about it's about pitching. It's like, am I going to pitch? If I'm helping you out, Matt, then then you obviously you're a, a, a an established creator who has been you know through several rodeo rodeos of of printing, um, you know, experienced issues also seen what it's like to uh, have something go flawlessly so if i'm helping you out then i'm going to be offering you advice like on this level if i'm helping somebody that you've put in touch who is doing their first comic ever then it's going to be down at this level and that's and that's fine like it's you know we were talking before um we started we we're talking about our kids and like i wouldn't talk to my kids in the same register as i talk to you because you got to you got to pitch appropriate for the audience, right? Yeah. So like, basically, you're saying you have to dumb it down when you're speaking to me. Now I get that. You know, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, and when yeah. I speak to Kid Park, she's <laughs> she's you know she knows she's well up there. Like, um, yeah. No, it's you know I can tell from from that uh, that contact form. People will also 
you know, drop in on Twitter. You know, I've got a bit of a persona on Twitter, which I swear hilarious I'm not. Hilarious persona, as... hilarious persona. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it starts. It started as hilarious. I think he's a bit bad tempered now. Um, but <laughs> but I'm I'm I mean, well, it's. I, I, it's a bit like a pro wrestling sort of thing. He, that, that that's me, but amped up to twelve. We we all have online Twitter personas. Like who I am on mm. Twitter is who I am, but it's not really who I am. Mm. The ego and stuff like that. And if people know me, they know that there's a little bit of that in me. But I'm not. I'm not the the massive cheerleader for myself that I pretend to be. Or, or, it would or be exhausting if we were if we were our online selves all the time. I I certainly couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, so people will. Uh, it, the the point is that the Twitter is meant to be vaguely approachable. It's meant to be a thing of you know you interact a couple of times and then you can ask a question and I will always answer it and I might take the mic but you know I'm I, I'll do it gently. Um, and then yeah, you know I mean so. Primary primary modes of contact are the the web form and and the Twitter. People will occasionally try and call me, and I'm 36. I'm a millennial. You know how we feel about phones, but like, if you keep ringing, then yeah, I'll pick up. But like, um, <laughs> okay, rather no, that's, not. That's cool. That's cool. So you know, absolute beginners always welcome. And obviously, this again, this is the great thing about Rich is. When I say hand-holded, I'm not saying that in a patronising way. because when you first print your first comic, it's it's daunting. You know, it is squeaky. So many bumps. things can go wrong. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, even now I get it. You know, say I've been printing my comics for like five or six years, and even when I get that first box back from the printer and mm. and I open it, you know, there's yeah, the heart, you know, is going absolutely crazy because you think. Yeah. Did I do everything right? And that's the great thing about, you know, uh, the personal touch that someone like Rich gives you. I'm doing just a massive advert for you now. This is brilliant. Uh, yeah. Is that, we, we, like again, it. we discussed this before, that you you touch every single side or page that, that, that comes through and you, you check it to make sure that, you know, stuff like the bleeds, you know, the, the order and stuff like that, it's all immaculate. So the chances of something everything. going wrong are slim to none. Yeah, I mean, things do go wrong because it's a mass production process. Uh, we always fix them, uh, you know, without, with, you know, no quibbles. Like, if it's something that I've, or that, that, that has been messed up at this end, then, then I will fix that. If it's something that was messed up at your end, then generally speaking, I will have tried to steer, steer you away from doing it in the first place. Uh, but yeah, every file goes through me uh, because I don't like being shouted at, but I believe that you have the right to have someone to shout at if something goes wrong. And I'd rather that you shout at me than at somebody I'm responsible for, if you see what I mean. So um, yeah, so part of the reason that it all goes through me is because I hate being shouted at so much that I will put in the extra effort to make sure that you don't do it. Absolutely fine. So I've, I am an absolute beginner. I, I've come to you, I've mm -hmm. contacted you through the website. Um, I've said, you know, Rich, you know, even my comic is ready or it's going to be ready in X amount of time. What's the next stage? You know, what what, what do you need from someone that's coming to you to print your book? You know, uh, what kind of format do you need? What kind of information do you need to give them to make sure that when the files come to you, that they're in the best possible shape and form so there is as little to do your end as possible? Mm. So it will depend on, yeah, there are so many variables. So somebody will come and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. And you think, right, okay, well, for a given value, yes, maybe. Um, and generally what I will do is I'll send back a quote. If we agree the quote, then I will say, right, here are templates for that specification. Now those templates can be very simple. If it's a subtle stitch thing, then one, then you get two templates back, a single page and a, and a spread um uh if it's a perfect bind then you'll get back a uh single or a single left hand a single right hand page and a cover template and they will all be specifically tied to the specification that we've agreed so if you start changing that and the spine width's going to change and don't change it after we've agreed it basically um and if it's a hardback then you get proper eldritch huge numbers of templates thrown at you it's uh it, it can get quite involved but the idea is these are supposed to be as close to idiot proof as is possible they're all up on the website they're mainly compatible with 
other printers as well. So that's just a kind of sort of free resource for anybody who. So who if needs someone's them because... over in the states and not able to, you know, use your, yeah. you know, because of, let's be honest, the shipping to other countries at the moment is just yeah. absolutely crazy. So you, there are resources on Rich's website. So if you are in the states or Australia or something like that, and you know you need to templates, they are all there free of charge from Rich. So you know, mm. give him a high five and a follow on Twitter for that. There you go. Um, so yeah, so I'll send back templates and say, right, okay, get your artwork fitted to these templates. And then depending on which software, you know, if you're working in InDesign, it makes more sense for you to send me a PDF. If you're working in Photoshop or Clip, it makes more sense to send flatten PDF, uh, bit of flatten PSDs or TIFFs. Uh, if you're working in GIMP, then you can't send me anything because that only works in RGB and you need to be in CMYK for print. So get a better program. Um, <laughs> whatever. Um, Only GIMPs use GIMP. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, GIMP is an excellent program for things that aren't printing. Um, you know, uh, it's the same as uh, PNG. I, people send me PNGs all the time. I'm like, it's portable network graphic network network doesn't support CMYK. It's not a printable file. Okay, anyway. so we, let's explain the difference between RGB and CMYK. So. Guys, if you are watching this video, you are watching it either on your phone or your laptop or your monitor, that kind of thing, or your TV, and they are calibrated for RGB, which is red, green, and blue. That's the spectrum Correct. of colors that they all use. When you print something, it's printed differently. It's printed in what's called CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and the K stands for black. So the color spectrum is different from what you will see on your screen. So if you are working in Photoshop, what you need to do is if you press control and Y, it will change what you're looking from, to, from RGB to CMYK. So you can get a better understanding of what something looks like when it's printed. Because the worst thing to do is like you'll have a nice bright red on your screen. And then when you get, get it printed, mm. it actually comes out orange. And that's because red is one of the most annoying things to try and get right for printing. So that is the difference between RGB and CMYK. I believe if, I, if I'm wrong, Rich, you know, slap me down, sir. <laughs> No, 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 that's that's right. It's also it's it's the difference between an additive and a subtractive process. So when I've uh, when I've got a blank screen, uh, then the screen is black and I start adding light in red, green and blue channels. And then I get to the color that I that I'm looking for. Um, so purple is made up of a mixture of, of red, green and blue. Nice. When I've got a blank sheet of paper, when I've got a blank sheet of paper, the blank sheet of paper is white and I'm adding ink, which is subtracting light, subtractive process. So I'm adding ink to get to the same or as close to the same shade. Because one is adding light and one is taking light away, the gamut on RGB is much wider than on CMYK. So for example, you can do neons on RGB because you're just adding more and more light no matter how much ink you chuck at, uh, uh, or process ink, I should say, you can do funny things with spot colors, but no matter how much ink you chuck at a piece of, of white paper, it's always gonna get darker. You can't, you know, if you're starting from pure white, anything you do to it is going to make it darker. It's just- You'll make it less white, which is- light. Just how yeah. light works. Yeah. Yeah, it's just how, just, just that's just what light is. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so no PNG, no, PNG RGB, PNG. No, no RGB files. Yeah, <laughs> so. um, uh, but you know, I will go through all of this, and I say, look, you know, this is the ideal thing. Quite often, what you will find then is that people will come back and say, all right, can I have a JPEG version of the template? That tells me something as well, because they can say, right, okay, yeah, you can. I can tell that you're working in Clip Studio now, but you don't actually want to be working in JPEG. Work in, if you're working in Clip Studio or Affinity, work in PSD because JPEG is a very lossy format. So every, uh, the, the, the advantage of the way that I work as opposed to the kind of uh, click and drop your artwork onto our, uh, pre-press that's all online which is all very clever and like works but really well for some people but the advantage of the way that I work is that I'm asking you lots of annoying questions but every time that you give me an answer I'm getting another piece of information about what you need and how we're gonna make sure that this comes out as well as possible so yeah so I will send across the templates and you come back you say oh, I have JPEG version okay well yes but here it is 
or come back and right i had to resize the template don't resize the template um or my artwork doesn't quite fit to that or <laughs> or or something like that in which case i know that you've got a bleeds problem right so let's explain the bleeds i've, I've explained this on the channel before and i try and explain it in the most rudimentary style ever but it's probably best to to get it from you and the way i look at it is you know if you have a piece of paper the bleed is basically an area on the outside of that image that's going to get cropped off by the printer and then inside that you've also got another area which is like the safe zone anything that you really mm -hmm. need to keep make sure that that is not in that zone because there is a chance that that may get lost or may get pushed into either you know the crease of the page or to the end of the page mm -hmm. but that's how i look at it but if you could explain it in your way it probably make a lot more sense to people because i'm an idiot okay so no no no, no. i mean that, that 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 works and also you've covered the, the inside safe zone, which not a lot of people get around to. One of the things that, one of the, the most common bits of the, uh, or common mistakes that I see is people who will have like a panel border that lands right, right on the safe zone. And I'm going, right, if that trims out by three millimeters, if it doesn't trim out by three millimeters, the best case scenario is that this trims perfectly and your panel, panel border is three millimeters from the edge of the page and looks cramped. The worst case scenario is that it trims three millimeters out and it's right on the edge of the page and looks ridiculous. Like, but people, it's one of the things that uh, you can tell when somebody's been working in the visual arts, not necessarily just comics, but the visual arts for a long time versus when they're slightly greener, is people who can use negative space and people who can say, it, there is a temptation when you're looking at it all on screen, there is a temptation to be like, I must fill the entire page. Every, every inch of this page must have gorgeousness on it. And actually that's not necessarily the way it's gonna look best in print. You know, a, another one people will have two pages that are, uh, that are facing when they're in print. And they're just so busy because they're only looking at one at a time. And there's so much going on. They're not a joined spread, but like it's really hectic. So yeah, so um, what a bleed is, uh, or the, the the reason, well, what a bleed is what is what you said. It's a three millimeter, always three millimeter, um, at least in the UK, uh, uh, extension of whatever's at the trim line of the canvas that uh, that can appear in print. If, if the trimming is off within three millimeters. See, you can't, people will say, oh, well, why can't you, why, why not simply trim perfectly every time? It's like, because it's going very, very quickly. And there are, as with any mass production process, there is, there's, a, there's a, a standard tolerance and we've got it down to, we as an industry have got it down to three millimeters, which actually is not too bad. Um, anything more than three millimeters and you should come back and say, look, this has been badly trimmed. But within three millimeters, the only way that you can get it more accurate than that is to have somebody leaning into the guillotine and moving the paper around as the, you know, as the Don't guillotine do comes down, you which you can only way. really Don't do, do 10 times because then you've run out of fingers. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you, if you imagine I'm stacking up your pages, I've got a big stack of them like that, and then uh, the guillotine's coming down, it's got sort of a heavy weight going like that and shaving them all off. Now, if they move ever so slightly under the pressure of that, or if they didn't all butt up perfectly, bear in mind they're going into that guillotine at about 30 miles an hour. They, 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 if there's any kind of movement at all, then it's going to trim slightly off. That's why you need a bleed. Is um, and you know people will say, oh well, you know, I I want to leave it blank. It doesn't require a bleed, and it's like, well, no, but it's going to look terrible. And it's it's harder for us to trim, or it's easier for, easier for us to trim perfectly if we know the bit that we're trying to miss. If you've just got a white border there, then then you're making things unnecessarily hard. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so and that's, then and that's... then it's gonna get it's gonna get screwed up, and then you're gonna shout at me. So, <laughs> but it's not your fault, and that, and that I think that's the big point that I'd like, I'd like to raise in this video is, you know, if you've done exactly what Rich or your chosen printer has said, if you've done it the right way, because these guys are professionals in what they do, 
if it messes up, unless it's a, like a massive printing error, it's down to you. And that's, I think that's important that the ownership is on you when you're printing your comic. As I said, you know, even like, you know, after five years, when I when I print my comics, I still have that squeaky bum time when I get a box back because you still have that level of doubt that, oh, did I do that bit properly? Did I do this bit properly? Is everything lined up? So, you know, make sure you do everything that Rich says to make ensure that your, your comic comes out immaculately because otherwise it's down to you. It's not down to Rich or down to your printer. It actually falls on you. So you need to take responsibility of that. So that's the bleed. That's the format. Let's talk about resolution. Now, yep. when I I always get my artwork back from my artist collaborators at 600 DPI because I like it in the highest possible resolution because I want everything to look immaculate. From a printer's perspective, what is the minimum? What's the maximum? You know, where's the sweet spot? Where where do you need your files to 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 be on that range? It's got to be 300. 300 is is print resolution um, and then we'll rip it at a different resolution but that, you don't need to worry about that you need to worry about 300 um, a lot of people will supply at 600 or think that they'll supply at 600 did you know in InDesign for example uh, if you import a bunch of images in uh, 600 um, the, and, and then export it using one of InDesign's built-in presets like high quality printing or, or pre-press or whatever they've got built in uh, PDF uh, 1XA is the is the classic I, I can never remember if it's 1XA or 1XA anyway um, they've all got built in presets and if you go under if you go and look in under compression on there you'll see that anything over 450 DPI is automatically knocked down to 300 so you can supply me with 1200 if you like and InDesign as you're exporting it will just go well that's ridiculous and knock it down to 300 yeah so uh, so what I tend to do is I've got my own presets, obviously, for exporting, um, and I've uh, set them to 449, because okay. 450, as I say, is what InDesign. I, so I, I save all of my artwork that's going into, uh, or I would save all of my artwork that's going in into, in, into an InDesign document at 449, um, because that way, even no matter what... Um, uh, preset you're using to export it's going to come out at 449 like and really as i say as long as it's over 300 makes no odds to me makes no odds to any printer but i understand the impetus to assume big number better and it gives um if it gives people a little bit of confidence then then fine just just do it as that if it gives you confidence do it at 600 and have it knocked down by indesign to, by to, to 300 if it gives you confidence it doesn't really matter uh what what will often happen is that you'll get somebody who's like oh yeah here are my 600 dpi files and you zoom in on them and you see they're full of fuzz particularly around lettering or lines uh you know line art just full of, of it's called jpeg artifacting um and you think, right, well, okay, those are very, very high resolution artifacts that will print and look really bad. So they're great resolution, but they're still there. And what, what's happened there is that someone has saved it for web and then saved it as a promo and then saved it as a Facebook and then done it for this and that. And it's been saved a million times and, and what you don't understand is that uh, every time that you make a change in Photoshop, you are doing a little bit of damage or whichever program you're using, you're doing a little bit of damage to your artwork. Um, so the more changes that you make, you know, fussing around with resolution and all that, you're just iteratively adding JPEG artifacts. And the old, uh, old person's and then, yeah, analogy of that is deep. literally, if you've got an old VHS cassette, you rec every time you record over it, you lose a little bit of quality. <laughs> For all us old folkies out there, so okay, so yeah. so when you're when you're saving, yeah. you know your files, save them in the format that they're going to be printed the first time, and don't mess around with you know doing them file this, you know file save, file save, file save. First time, but as they are, yeah. at least three hundred DPI, or just version control. Yeah, just version control, just different folders like within, you know, so you, you you've got your folder with your all your comic pages saved. And you've got a web version, and you've got a print version, and those two folders don't cross. And you know, 
because the web version needs to be 72 dpi it doesn't matter you know it can be it can be very very low res just make sure that you're not using that you that you're not crossing files back between the two folders you know set up as a photo photoshop action if you have to that's yeah, yeah. what i do okay okay so that's that's formats that's bleeds that's that's resolution mm -hmm. what else do people need to know when printing their comic uh they need to have an idea they need to have an idea of the kind of um kind of look and feel that they're going for so it can be quite helpful to have if you've got um you know you can say all right well uh, i picked up this book uh, by Matt McGarvey, and I want to I want to match that exactly, and then I can go and look at the spec for it, or I can go get a copy of it if if it's not something that I've got the spec handy, um, and I can say right, okay, well I know it, this this is the finish, and because I I can tell papers by touch and feel and look, you not necessarily that it, it's not something that needs to be in your wheelhouse, but if you say to me uh, for example, right, I want it to look like um, uh like warwick johnson warwick johnson cadwell's uh old, old dark house then i know that it needs to be matte laminated cover uncoated interiors printed on digital press ideally you know if you aren't sure then the best thing to do would be to send over some bits of paper you can make these decisions yourself as uh, not bits of paper bits of artwork you make these decisions yourself but if you send over a bit of artwork and i can see right that's really bright and that needs color pop and you're talking about printing a thousand which means that we're printing litho which will print darker okay so i prefer an uncoated paper and i tend to steer people towards an uncoated paper but in that case because of the other parameters the the quantity and the uh the brightness that you're looking at looking for that's going to need to go on a silk because silk pops color better um you know similarly i tend to uh go for a matte lamp myself on covers um because i think it looks nice um so if you specifically want something that's high gloss like high impact uh then you need to tell me that like um because otherwise you know Otherwise, I'll default to my own thing, and and you know, and everyone does that to a certain extent. They, you know, even the um, if you if you've got a, a kind of an entirely online like pick your own options thing, the default options are going to be somebody's preference. You know, like um, so yeah. So I need to sort of have an idea of what you're aiming for. Need an idea of when you need it for. Uh, well, that's that's one of the other questions I was going to say. Uh, th let's talk about lead time. So, um, mm. obviously, we've not had any comic conventions for the last, you know, fourteen months or so. It's probably safe to say yeah. they are starting to ramp up. And as as you know, as we discussed before, you know, before we went on 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 record, a lot of kickstarters mm. at the moment. A lot of people, a lot of people, you know, are starting their books. You know, and you know, the books are probably not ready yet, even though they're, they're kickstarting. You know, they're getting their funding just so they can pay for their art their colors and the print and that kind mm. of thing so say for example we have got a uh, thought bubble in november of this year i believe in in harrogate oh, and um so so that's november everyone's gonna want anyone in the uk's gonna want their books for thought bubble what kind of lead time do people need to give you to make because you, you again you're not an online service you are a you know um a personalized service you touch every page that comes through you know, there's going to be hundreds of people, you know, sending their books through you to print. It's going to take you days, weeks and stuff to, to, to prep, you know, this kind of thing. So mm. in an ideal world, you know, a realistic world, what kind of lead time does a creator need to come to someone like yourself saying, I'm coming to Fort Bubble. When do you need my pages for to ensure that you can fit them into your schedule? Otherwise, it can't be done in time. Mm. I mean, it will, again, it's it, unfortunately every question that you're going to ask me and say, it would depend um so you know it will depend on quantity so if it's going to go uh digital for example which is uh short runs of just for the sake of an of a round number of say up to 500 then that is going to take about a week from proof approval so things that can delay proof approval uh basically 
include me having to do a bunch of stuff to your artwork to make it print ready uh you not replying to my proof email although that's quite uncommon but the main one is is you uh you send me something and i'm like right okay i need to do x number of hours work on this and that's fine quite happy to do it I'm quite happy to <laughs> whinge about it online uh i'm willing to do it um you know it's part of the part of the service and part of the pricing structure is that i will do things like that um and i'll either do them myself or i'll come back to you with a very very detailed email with screenshots and all that sort of stuff saying this is how you do it. um but yeah if you're up to about 500 then then you you need about a week from proof approval if it's more than 500 that then starts to be that goes that goes life though and then that starts to be a sort of thing of um you're sending me a job and so are the next eight people and i've got a kind of jigsaw them all into place and that's when you start talking about schedules and sheets and filling things up and with digital it's all a bit kind of like just keep feeding it just chuck what you can through as fast as you can through and we'll sort it out you know we'll sort out efficiencies later with litho in order to maintain the kind of price that you're being offered it has to hit its slot um and that might mean that you send me the artwork and I get your sign off for it and and I say right well, it's going to be two weeks and you say right, oh, that's fine two weeks is fine um and then I don't actually look at it again until 13 days or 12 days because then it only takes an hour to print it's just that it has to go into that hour slot otherwise it's not gonna otherwise I'm gonna lose money on the on the, the job um which I don't like to do um uh so yeah, so it will depend, but generally speaking, I say anything up to about 500, do you know what? Give it five working days for production and delivery, then give it two working days, particularly around Thought Bubble because I'm gonna be manic. I'm gonna be busy, yep. Yeah, and then give it two, no, give it one day for buffer for if you're on the toilet when the courier comes <laughs> or if, the courier has a breakdown, um, particularly around November, because Christmas is starting up, um, you know, or or X Y Z, or or it snows. Like it's this has happened before, not around Thought Bubble, but um, a few years ago around Troops, because Troops Believers is in what February, February late time, January, yeah. early February, yeah. Um, and uh, we've got trucks coming out of Cambran in uh, in South Wales. February in South Wales, there's a lot of snow about. Like, so you know, uh, acts of, acts of God, you need to, you need to prepare for yeah. that. So you know, okay, yeah, allow a day or two for that, and then you know, so so then you're basically up to about two weeks. Now I can do things quicker. I will do things quicker, but you need to be talking to me about. And you need to know what you're doing because if there's stuff that needs to be changed and yeah. stuff like that, that's when it elongates. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to, if you're going to slip your deadline, that's okay. And I will tell you, look, you can't because I've let X, Y, and Z others slip their deadline. And because I know the industry or I know the, the um, scene relatively well, I know who needs a bit more slack. I know, for example, if I'm speaking with your with, with your good self then i can say to you no no you can't have extra time because i know you don't need it because i know <laughs> that you know what you're doing i have no idea what i'm doing anything yeah everything. <laughs> or uh the maddiest boys um you know uh rob jones and mike sandbrook and and that lot and alistair wooden uh you know they so if they're putting together um you know a a, a new a new book for Thought Bubble. I know that Rob Jones letters about 40% of UK's indie comics. I know he knows what files need to look like. So if he comes to me and says, oh, Rich, I uh, need a couple of extra days, then I'll say to him, Rob, do you need a couple of extra days because you've taken on too much work lettering? Or do you need an extra couple of days because, you know, you just haven't, haven't got around to this? Or do you not need an extra couple of days because you're not getting them? Like... <laughs> Because I know him, I know him well enough 
that I can just say to him, look, I know that you're good enough that you don't need this extra time. Just pull Somebody your finger out, who... get your stuff done, what you need to do, and just send me the files. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody who is uh, doing their first ever book doesn't know anything about or you know has only very rudimentary knowledge of the software they need those two extra days you don't like um and that's that's an advantage that you have from having done this for a decade so now basically you know, you rich rules uk printing with an iron fist he will decide <laughs> if you could have those extra days on no but that's good because you know as, as again you know the whole point of this channel is to help people on their comic making journey because say printing your first comic is 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 a you know it's a daunting mm. thing and the fact that there's people like 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 you out there that you know you, and you do go above and beyond and it you don't get enough gratitude, I don't think. And I just want to say thank you from the UK. Kind of you. Um, but that's, but, that's the, cool. but the point of that is is that it is helpful, I think, and I've been told that it is helpful to have somebody who has a bit more of a kind of uh, bird's eye view of of what else is happening in the scene at the time. Like I I don't do everything that goes into thought level, that would be ridiculous, obviously, but I know which books are roughly are gonna be launching when. I know how to or I, I keep an eye out for kickstarters i keep an eye out for or i know when a kickstarter is going because i've quoted for it so i know that the kickstarter is going to launch in a couple of weeks uh having that uh that bird's eye view of this is roughly what's going to be going into thought bubble for example is quite helpful for everyone i think because it means that you know I can kind of arrange people in order of, right, what do I need to do to make sure not just that you get to Thought Bubble with your comics, but that everyone gets to Thought Bubble. Where do you have to go in my timeline so that nobody loses out? So, you know? so it's safe to say, you know, as a creator, if you're going out there and making your first comic, you're doing your first conventions, you know, you not only are you keeping an eye on you know what's happening like with kickstarters and comic cons as a creator you mm. kind of need to know what's going on with comic cons so if you are planning to do yeah. you know something like thought bubble it's probably best to have your comic ready at least a month before the, the con convention so you can reach out to someone like richard go this is the comic it's going to be ready on this deadline so you've got that two week mm. grace period before those two weeks that you need to prep it so month mm. having your book a month before you need it is probably the safest bet if we're saying yeah yeah and also that then gives you the opportunity to uh try and get some reviews uh you know there's only so many there's very limited review slots available with the kind of the reputable reviewing sites um and you want to be in as as early as you can and like you know I, there are some that will have a requirement that they'll only review something if it's in hard copy they'll only review something if it's uh if it's available online so that people can follow a link to purchase it after reading the review there's they, they've all got different requirements but you know yeah it, you can have things cheap fast or good and there's you can pick two out of three and that's true of virtually everything in life you know um the more time that you give me the less chance there is of something going wrong and also if you've given me time and something does go wrong time to well, change it and get it yeah, yeah if, if if something does go wrong that's that's obviously that's awful but if you've told me about it the monday before thought bubble then i've got time to fix it potentially if you tell me about it or, or come up with a solution if you tell me about it on friday of thought bubble i've already had three beers so <laughs> i don't i'm done i'm over like when you guys are gearing up to do your sales i no one can touch me. It's the only time of the year I turn off my uh, email. I, I, well, it's because you've got no one, no one hassling you, asking where where my books are because they're all on the floor. Yeah. And you, you yeah, know, exactly. you, can, you can go and punch them in the head for you know causing you absolute chaos. Because I can imagine just you know from what what you do is like October is like do you know what don't even call me, don't even call me, don't even text yeah. me unless it's about you know your project or about the print. You know, like I no, you're not, you are not getting an answer. That that is your busiest period. So no, I totally yeah, get that. Because that also can that also coincides with a lot of the um the work that I do for commercials and for universities and that sort of thing. Everyone comes back basically. Everyone comes back at the end of August, having had their uh, summer holiday, and then the next three months are hell. Um, so you know nobody does anything throughout July or August. 
So if you want something, that's a good time to get something done. July, August, you can have Rich's attention 100 percent so get your books ready yeah now. absolutely <laughs> yeah I, I got I, I got nothing done um but yeah uh there's that's a hell ride for for three months from from september through to november um such as that you know <laughs> bring on full anyway, bubble. Sorry, you missed it last year come on let's be honest but now that's cool um, oh i did yeah <laughs> then so okay so we've covered like you know the uh, resolution file formats bleeds all, all that kind of jazz uh, obviously time leads that kind of thing of when books need to come out. Is there any mm. other advice that you would give to someone that's printing their first comic for the first time, just from, you know, your expert knowledge about the subject? Be realistic, I think. So there's a whole, um, there's a, on the, on the website, there's um, a blog post that I wrote six, seven years ago now uh, that says advice, it's called advice for first time comic printers. It goes straight from the, from, from the homepage, you can get that from the top menu. But, and I read it the other day and it, I think it mostly stands. Um, there are people who will come and they'll be like, it's my first ever comic book. Uh, and I would like a thousand copies and I would like spot UV and I'd like French flaps and I'd like it, um, I, you know, X, Y, Z, essentially moon on the stick stuff. And you think, right, okay, so, even if, even if we could get all of that, which we probably can't because you're probably coming too late because it's your first comic and you don't know what you're doing. But even if we could get all of that sorted, you're going to need to charge eight pounds, ten pounds for this for this uh, stapled floppy comic book, and no one's ever heard of you, and you're not. It's not going to happen. People, people are not going to lay down that kind of money. Yeah, you've been on con floors. Like I, when I go to, uh, I only go to Thought Bubble these days with money or with with the intent of spending money because you can quite easily just walking around Thought Bubble come out 500 pounds lighter just on one on one, circuit. one thing yeah, yeah people have to start being or people, people sorry go on. no no I was going to say because especially at Thought Bubble because it's uh well they'll give him Thought Bubble an advertisement they should really sponsor the channel um you know it's pretty much one of uh the only sure. UK comic cons that is purely comics you know there, there is no there is cosplay to a certain extent but there's no mm. tv celebrities that kind of thing. which is, in my opinion there's nothing wrong with that kind of you know with the convention side but you know mm. thought bubble is is literally just comics and as you said like you can walk around like one circuit and just empty your pockets and that's you done for the next two days you've got no more money to spend because you've got it all in there mm. and it, it, it's hard i mean that's why i never leave my table because <laughs> i don't want to spend any money <laughs> if i'm sat there um if I'm sat there and I'm faced with a choice between a uh, comic that I've never heard of, creator I've never heard of, and it's 32 pages, and it yes, it's got a thousand bells and whistles on it, but it's a tenor. And then next to them is somebody who I do know who's got a lay five book, uh, you know, two, uh, or 120 page book, complete arc of a story. And that's also, or oh, that's 12 pounds. Twelve pounds for a complete arc of story sounds better than ten pounds for shiny version of you know introduction to story. You know, and you'd be better off in that case if you're the the creator. You'd be better off saying, right, okay, well, this is this is the first chapter in my in my story. It's thirty two pages. I want to make it so it looks pro, make it so it looks good, but it doesn't need a lenticular cover. Like it's not a collect. I'm not making collectors editions here. Like so, yeah. So you got to be realistic about you know, and that 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 goes for everything. It's a similar sort of thing to um, when you're deciding how many to order. There's no point if you've set up a pre-order or you set up a Kickstarter and you've sold 200 copies. There's no there's no point ordering 10,000 units because yeah, all right, the price per unit is super low, but you're not going to sell them all. And especially when it comes to, I mean, again, this is this is something that uh, I've learned because again, I will be looking at the Kickstarter route in uh, a couple of months' time with one of my comments because I did it before mm. and failed miserably. Um, but when I, you know, do my comics, I pay for them myself. I pay for the printing myself, and that's why I hustle so much because I know I've invested my own cash, so I need to sell every single one. And some of my buddies mm. that have done Kickstarters, you know, I'll see them at some conventions and I'll go, "How's it going? You know, how the sales going?" And they go sold hardly anything and i always say 
but why? You know, you mm. kickstart a run, you go, the Kickstarter not ruined it for me, but like everyone that's at Fault Bubble back the Kickstarter, so they're not going to buy the same book again. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. So exactly. You can't can't sell that twice. Like, yeah. And 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 you know that's about knowing your market. That's about you know um, you know I hate to be kind of uh, unkind about about it, but say for example, if you've got a Twitter following of of a hundred, that's that's a hundred potential sales but you're not going to sell to every single one of them but it's, it's 100 potential so you're not going to do as well as someone who's got eleven thousand followers you just no, it's course. just it, it's brand loyalty the, you know the, yeah no yeah I, I totally agree and we will be covering sales of comic books in future videos mm. don't worry about that because uh, one of my face on the concrete you know really screwed up was um printing a, a second issue of of a series and i printed you know first of all i printed 100 a few years ago First issue printed 100, sold out. Next Comic Con, uh, printed, you know, more of the first issue and I printed the same amount in the second issue. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of hit me bollocks. Not everyone that bought the first issue is going to buy the second issue because not everyone likes, is going to like the comic that you do. And I was left with so many yeah. issue twos. It was unbelievable. And this is one of the things that I learned. And this is something that we're going to yeah. cover in, in future videos. But you're absolutely right. Keep it simple, keep it realistic, try and keep that price point. A, a, a good place and as long as the quality of the printing is there you know that's abs absolutely mm. gonna gonna help help you move your book so but it's also about your own self-esteem it's a thing of you know if you blow through if if, if you've got 100 copies of issue one and you sell 100 copies of issue one then you feel like you're 10 feet tall if you've got 100 issues of issue oh sorry 100 copies of issue one you sell 10 you know it feels so great like you know it's it's a self-esteem and it's it's about um giving yourself the motivation to make issue two you know it's very hard to pick yourself up from uh to pick yourself up and say right i'm gonna i'm gonna move on to my next issue if you've still got boxes and boxes of it of, of the first issue clogging up your hallway it's much easier to feel motivated if you have if if, it, if it's gone well you know, it's, it's but just I, common, I, I think this sense. comes down right. to, to salesmanship, though, because uh, I do not consider my comics to be better than anybody else's on the comic blog. Never have, never will. Everyone is equal. We're all making comics. We're all living the dream, that kind of thing. I sell more, and I'm not being egotistical, I promise you. I sell more because I work my ass off selling more. You know, I interact with everyone that comes to my table. I interact with people coming. And again, we're going to do this in other videos, but. I see people, well, I've been through this on the channel, I see people sitting there on their phones talking to the people next to them, you know, ignoring people as they go past, mm. and then, you know, go, I've, I've had a crap show, you know, I've sold 20 copies, you know, this, this not not for full bubble, but they'll go like, this This Comic Con is absolute crap, they're more, they're more focused on Funkos and celebrities, and it's simply not the case, you know, mm. I'll do, you know, an MCM in London, which is a big show, like 120,000 people, you know, come through that door every day, I sell between 250 and 270 comics over that weekend. My comics are no better. It, it, I work my mm. ass off. And even if, you know, 10% of that audience that comes through the door is there for comics, is I'm there to sell to them. And if you're not paying attention, you're not, you know, being personable and saying yeah. hello to people and, you know, having a chat, you know, not just trying to physically sell your books, but just interacting with people, you're not going to sell. And that's one of the big parts of comics that I think people, hustle, yeah. people think I've made a comic. There you go, guys. Knock yourselves out. And then, as you said, they'll sell 10 copies and they feel really deflated that no one likes their book. And it's not that no one likes the book. It's no one's seen the book. You can't rely on a couple of well-placed reviews and, you know, your 100 Twitter followers to to build your build your following. It You, you kind of have to wait. It's like this channel. You know, the channel started with zero subscribers. We're up to, you know, 600, 700 now. That didn't happen overnight. It's taken nine months of me grinding every week for 50 weeks to try and get this this channel to where it is you know and in comics is exactly the same i think people people like the comic side of comics but they don't realize it's actually the comic business there is a business side and when you start making your own comics mm. you in fact becoming your own business owner exactly the same as you with regards to like the printing side that's yeah. your business yes it's comics and comics are fun and everyone loves the comics but at the end of the day there, there is a money aspect to it and you know god bless capitalism you know it, yeah you, you can't but no but like you you're absolutely right, and you've got to, you know, you've got to to a certain extent. You've got to have a shtick. You've got to have a, you know, uh, you know, 
so as I say, I started doing comic printing as a specific sideline about 10 years ago now. I think it's about 10 years ago. Because I was bored of doing pizza leaflets. And the pizza leaflets pay for a very nice <laughs> lifestyle. Um, nice slices. But they are, you know, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, they, they, are, they are dull, dry work. Um, this is more fun, less lucrative. Um, but I like, you know, I like helping people out and, um, you know, and, and, and seeing the various ways that people can screw up a print file. It's always it's a lesson every day. Um, but, you know, it became, if, it, if, it, if I wanted it to be a serious thing where I could afford to devote a significant portion of my time as a business owner to it, then it had to, as you say, it had to be treated like a business. There has to be a sort of thing of, you know, this is how I operate. If you can operate with me, then then great and if not then then there are alternatives out there and you should and you should pursue them and I, I, with it although it's a personalized service and it's a kind of um it's a very small scene where everyone knows each other like it doesn't mean everyone has to has to work the same way and it doesn't mean you know it is perfectly possible for people to get on without uh without needing to be best pals and without needing to um uh to treat everything like it's personal because a lot of it is business and a lot of it is you know this is how i work this is how you work do those two things can uh do those things uh gel if they don't then it's not worth either of our time because we're both different. like anyway so uh, no, you're bit, absolutely bit spot on. Side, but... No, no, that's absolutely, and again, that's the same with working with any kind of collaborator. I mean, I, I've I've had it with artists. You know, I've had books where you know mm. we've started to produce artwork, and the the project's not gelled properly, and we've both had to you know call it quits, call it a day, and move on. Mm. As long as you know it's it, you mm. know it's done in a polite way, and we've got on after we've left. You know, I can honestly mm. say that I've never fallen out with one of my collaborators to the point where that relationship's deteriorated that far. So no, it, it, again, it is business, and you know. Yeah manners you know are a key part of that so yeah. no totally get that um anything else before we go because i realize you've been incredibly generous with your time rich no 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 so i, I um i tend to run this is part of the reason why i don't answer the phone is because if i do then <laughs> i ramble um i'm trying to think no i mean as i say there's that that advice for first time comic printers on the site which i think which i think does stand up um the best thing that you can do if you don't know what you're doing uh, is ask somebody who does. Um, there aren't any stupid questions, really. Um, there are questions that I might have answered half a dozen times today uh, already, but that doesn't make them stupid. That's, you know, there, there are... Uh, it, it, there is no question so stupid that not asking it and then doing it wrong isn't stupider. Yeah. If you have to ask what bleeds are half a dozen times, that's still better than sending something without bleeds. Like a country mile better. Like. Um, no, that is a stupid question. So, if they've asked it eight million times and they're just not getting it, that, that, that is a stupid. No, it's actually not a stupid question. It's a stupid person. <laughs> I mean. You might very well think that I couldn't possibly comment. Um, uh, yeah, so if you don't know what you're doing, ask someone who does. You are, when you're going into business, as you say, producing your own comic books, you are setting up something where you are going to be, in your case, writer, but in, in a lot of cases, writer, artist, editor, stock manager, logistics manager, production manager, uh, chief promoter um hr such as it is um well i suppose if you've got artists in hr yeah you, you are suddenly taking on huge numbers of of jobs which you might not have any experience of whatsoever you need to start asking people who do have experience and and working out where uh where you can smooth um your process out uh, and that's one of the reasons, as I say, I've got nothing against people who uh, 
who have experience of doing print and therefore feel com comfortable approaching kind of one of the, the entirely online printers that, that are just click and click and drop nothing against them because they know what they're doing and generally speaking that work isn't much fun for me anyway it's more reminiscent of uh pizza leaflets than anything else um yeah um because it's because it's rote work because it's rote work um but if you if you don't know that if you don't have that level of confidence which comes from experience then yeah you need to be talking to someone like me and there are others but you need to be talking to someone like me who i have seen all of the problems that can happen with i think with independent comic printing an independent comic production and i know what has worked for some people what hasn't worked for some people and i can probably tell you with a varying degrees of politeness like this is a good idea or this is brave you may wish to revisit this um <laughs> but i can't do that if you're not asking no so yeah yep. ask questions fair enough fair enough rich Thank you very um, much for your time. Um, again, all of Richie's no, uh, website details are going to be in the links uh, uh, in the description below. So please, as I said before, again, I'm going to look right into the camera. If you're in the UK and you're going to be printing your first comic, speak to Rich. He will help you and make sure he looks the absolute best. So, And it's a service that is worth every single penny. I, c I cannot stress that enough. So... Rich, thank you so much for your thank time. You. And remember, if no I worries, can mate. make comics, anyone can. Take care. Take care.